As we gather around the Advent wreath today, we rejoice that Christmas is a time of prayer and of open hearts when we sing songs of joy. Christmas is a time of worship, the moment when the busy of us, busiest of us pause and wonder. Christmas happens when God comes to us in love through Jesus Christ and fills us with love for all humankind. We light this candle to proclaim the coming of the light of God into the world. With the coming of this light, there is love. Such great love helps us to love God and one another. We thank God that Jesus showed God's love for every person, babies and children, old people and young, sick people and those who were strong, rich people, and those who were poor. In this Advent season, may the baby Jesus come to us and give us love in our hearts for all people. Amen.
Let us pray. Great God of power, we praise you for Jesus Christ, who came to save us from our sins. We thank you for the hope of the prophets, for the song of the angels, and for the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. We thank you that in him you became flesh and dwelt among us, sharing our human hurts and pleasures. We thank you that in Jesus you came to be one with us, with all of us. Glory to you for your grace-filled love. Glory to you, eternal God, through Jesus Christ, Lord of Lords, and King of Kings, forever. Amen. We are sinful people in need of restoration, but sometimes we are too stubborn or ignorant to even realize it. We are capable of such evil as well as such goodness. Let us confess our sins that we might be washed of evil and welcome the goodness that God intends for us. Let us pray together. We tend our flocks, O God, like the shepherds of old. We tend our flocks. Save us from the tedium and from the loss of wonder. Forgive us for our absorption with our own lives, our own needs, our own striving. Save us, O God. Appear once again above our fields. Illumine the skies above our homes and classrooms, shops and offices. Let the heavens ring out the joy of your coming. And let our lives be filled by the saving power of the newborn Christ. Send us to Bethlehem again. Let us see the great deed you have done in our world so that when we return to our fields and our flocks, we will go so glorifying and praising you for all you have done. God has given ear to our confession, and God's face has shined upon us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you and I are saved, saved from our sins, saved to our faithful Savior, whose steadfast love is gifted to the world. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
At this time in our service, our children are excused for Sunday school. And as you leave us, we pray for God's blessing to be upon you as you continue to live and to grow in God's grace, God's goodness, and God's love. A warm welcome to all who worship with us on this snowy, chilly, windy fourth Sunday of Advent. Whether whether if you're worshiping with us here in the sanctuary or if you join us for our live stream broadcast or our recorded broadcast on Facebook or YouTube, it is our prayer that this time of worship may be a time of spiritual renewal and recreation for you this last week, these last few days before Christmas. If you're worshiping with us here in the sanctuary, I would invite you to take the red friendship books, which are at the end of both ends of the pews, pass them through the pews, let us know of your presence. If you're worshiping with us on, online, on Facebook, if you'd simply let us know that you're with us there as well, we would be glad to hear from you. Following worship today, I remind you that our Presbyterian women will be having their cookie and candy sale in Weir Foyer. Yesterday, six volunteers spent three hours plating 119 plates of cookies baked by numerous Presbyterian women. The cookies are ready for you to purchase at $5 a plate immediately following worship. I'll ask that you please stay in your seats until the completion of the post loot. Don't go rushing out of here. They'll still be there. You don't need to leave during the sermon because they'll still, they'll still be there. But all the proceeds from today's sale will be shared with our friends at the Second Mile Center in Detroit and will be a wonderful way to support their ministry. So again, our thanks to the volunteers who were here yesterday and to all who who supported this project of our Presbyterian women. While you're out there with buying cookies, um, if you haven't yet picked up your offering envelopes for next year, they're out in Weir Foyer too. If you've asked for envelopes, they are on the table ready for you to take home. And then after you purchase your cookies, everyone's invited to continue our time of fellowship during coffee hour in Memorial Parlor. Today, as part of our worship service, we are receiving the Christmas Joy offering. There is a special insert and special offering envelope uh, in today's bulletin. Uh, The Christmas Joy offering is one of four special offerings of the Presbyterian Church USA. Uh, This offering supports and provides assistance for both current and retired church workers in time of need and to their families as well. And money from this offering supports the work and helps to develop future leaders at Presbyterian-related ethnic uh, schools and colleges. As I said, you can read more about the special offering on today's insert, and again, there is a special offering envelope in today's bulletin. I don't think that I need to tell you this, but Christmas Eve is this coming Saturday. There will be two service, candlelight services here at Cherry Hill on Saturday evening. The first service will take place here in the sanctuary at five o'clock and will include special music by the choir and will end, of course, with the candle lighting ceremony and the singing of Silent Night. The second service will take place in the chapel at 11 o'clock in the evening and will feature uh, Katie Garber as our guest soloist, and the service will end at midnight to usher in Christmas morning. I hope that you will be willing to include one or both of these services in your Christmas Eve plans and to invite your family and friends to gather with you. And then next Sunday, Christmas Day, uh, being that it's Sunday, we will hold a Christmas Day worship service at 1015, uh, Sunday morning as always, and that service will be held in the chapel next Sunday morning. Finally, just a word of thanks to all of you for all of the many ways that you have supported the efforts of our congregation this Advent season. 
This past week, we packed up all of the donations that we received from the warming tree. They were shared with students uh, at Bryant Middle School and with uh, students who attend the Word tutoring program at Calvin East Presbyterian Church in Detroit. When they were picked up on uh, Tuesday morning by the, our school and community liaison, she was just overwhelmed by what you did. And when I took the, our donations to Calvin East on Monday morning, again, they were just so grateful, so overwhelmed by the generosity of the people of Cherry Hill. Thursday, I took over 50 personal hygiene items to First Step. They were speechless when they saw all that you did. They are so grateful. And we don't know how many lives we have blessed by our donations this Christmas season. So on behalf of all of them, a profound thank you to all of you. And then today, our church... I feel lost up here with all these poinsettias. <laughs> You have done so much to beautify our, our church for Christmas, and you have donated to our Mission Committee's Benevolence Fund. So to all who have donated in any way, shape, or form, you truly are a remarkable group of God's people. And on behalf of everyone, I simply say thank you. And now may we continue in our worship. A reading from Psalm 80, verses 1 through 7 and 17 through 19. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim. Shine forth before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh. Stir up your might to come and save us. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine, that we may be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with the bread of tears, and given them tears to drink in full measure. You make us the scorn of our neighbors. Our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us. O God of hosts, let your face shine that we may be saved. But let your hand be upon the one at your right hand, the one whom you made strong for yourself. Then we will never turn back from you. Give us life, and we will call on your name. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
Our second reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in a manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This Advent season, our Sunday sermons have followed the chapters in the book that we are using for our Monday afternoon study group. And uh, today we bring this series to a conclusion with the angels and the shepherds. The title of today's sermon is actually the title of a Christmas carol that comes from Eastern France and was first published in 1842. Shepherds, shake off your drowsy sleep. Rise and leave your silly sheep. Angels from heaven around are singing. Tidings of great joy are bringing. Cometh at last the print, the age of peace. Strife and sorrow now shall cease. Prophets foretold the wondrous story of this heaven-born prince of glory. Let us pray. Indeed, angels from heaven around are singing tidings of great joy they are bringing. Open our ears, O God, that we might hear the message they sing to us this day. And then open our hearts that we might receive that message. May we be like the shepherds of old and hurry to see what it is that you have promised us. To that end, O oh God, bless the reading, the hearing, the proclaiming, and the living of your word this day. For we make our prayers in the name of the word made flesh, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Have you ever stopped to realize that most of our mental images of, about Christmas come from medieval art and Christmas cards? I recently talked to someone about how many Christmas cards show the three wise men coming to the baby Jesus just minutes after his birth. Now, I've ruined people's Christmases before by saying this, but I'll do it again this year. 
If you read the biblical account carefully, it could have been up to at least two years after Jesus was born that the Magi came and offered their gifts to the child. In fact, Mary and Joseph aren't even in the stable any longer. The gospel tells us that they are in a house. More than that, we have no idea how many wise men actually came. Christmas cards show three, but again, the biblical account does not give a number. We know it was more than one because the Bible talks about men, plural. But was it two, or three, or six? or even 16. We just don't know. Matthew's story doesn't tell us. The unnumbered magi brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and I guess maybe that's where the idea of three comes from. I shared all of this once at in a class I was leading at the church in New York, and I later received a handmade Christmas card from one of the members of that class, which displayed six wise men bearing gifts to the newborn king. We had a good laugh about that, but at least she was one person in the class that got the point. Now, if we're confused about the magi, the wise men, then we probably misinterpret the shepherds as well. I don't know about you, but I think we generally have an image of gentle folk uh, singing sweet songs while sitting around a campfire. (laughs) While in fact, shepherding was a despised occupation. The pictures that we have of the shepherds is sitting in the field getting ready to hear angels sing evokes a positive pastoral image for us. We have so sentimentalized them on our Christmas cards that they really just look like a group of friendly folk waiting to go to a homecoming celebration. But no picture is farther from reality. The shepherds that John read about this morning weren't the pleasant hallmark faces that we're used to seeing this time of the year. I was recently reminded from a commentary written by the Reverend Dr. David Luce, a professor at Luther Seminary, how shepherds at the time of Jesus' birth were not romantic or saintly types. From years of Christmas pageants, movies, lovely cards, artwork, beautiful carols, the image of shepherds which has emerged is of relatively clean, nicely quaffed animal lovers who drop everything and travel to Bethlehem in order to find the Savior of the world, all based on the word of some angel. But actually, men became shepherds because they couldn't find any other way to support themselves. They did not become shepherds out of a desire to protect or spend time with cute little sheep. In fact, more often than not, they couldn't stand sheep. (laughs) Let alone shepherding was hard work. And the shepherds would abandon the sheep in a second if something better came along. Sheep back then were considered dirty and dumb and stubborn. And the men who herded them were just a notch above. Almost. They didn't necessarily carry signs at the entrance to the villages saying, we'll herd sheep for food, but pretty darn close. And if a group of shepherds came and said that it was an angel that had spoken to them, well, it was entirely possible then that they just simply drank a little too much cheap wine. But in Luke's gospel... 
These are just the first people, the angels first reveal the birth of Jesus to. And it is intentional. As Professor Luce writes, quote, Should we really be surprised then that these are the first people who will hear the message of God's redemption? Across Luke's gospel, one of the dominant themes is that God comes for those who are on the outside, those who are poor and vulnerable and of no account to the world. Why? Perhaps because they are the ones predisposed to listen and to rejoice. Oh, angels could have come to Herod or Augustus or Quirinius or any of the other p powerful characters that have made their cameo appearances in Luke's story. But why would they rejoice at the announcement of a king? What need do they have of God's redemption when to all outward appearances they themselves are like God's? No, the angels come and sing their news to those for whom it means something. Outcasts, ne'er-do-wells, the poor and the, and the lonely and the lowly, unwed mothers and lowly shepherds, and all the rest, all that is, who are in need. For ultimately, the only requirement to receive God's love, God's good news, is to need it. It's easy to follow this logic throughout all the Gospels, how Jesus continually reached out to the marginalized, so the fact that his birth is announced to the shepherds makes perfect sense. It helps set the tone from the beginning of Luke's Gospel, and it proclaims that something new is happening here. God, through Jesus, is coming to the world in a new way and is saying, in essence, who I find valuable is very different and much broader than who the world finds valuable. And Professor Luce concludes by saying, and we would do well to pay attention to that. Yes, we would do well to pay attention to that. And maybe... I suggest to you that's why God sent the angels to the shepherds, to truly let them and to let the world and to all who would forever read this story, to let us know that this child who was born is truly for all people, even the most ordinary and the most unlikely, even for people like you and me. Jesus is good news for the saints, and he's good news for shepherds, too. Jesus is just not for churchgoers, but for non-churchgoers. What's more, Jesus is good news for people who, for one reason or another, have failed to live up to God's standards. Jesus is just simply good news. It doesn't matter who we are or are not. It doesn't matter what we've done or what we haven't done. It, God comes to each one of us just as we are. God accepts us just as we are. We don't have to reach a certain standard of holiness before God loves us. No. God loves us just as we are. We don't have to prove ourselves. The Christmas message is that nobody, nobody is outside the scope of the love of God. Now, if you haven't, if you're part of the Monday afternoon class and you haven't read your chapter for tomorrow, 
I'll save you a little bit of time right now. I read my chapter ahead of time, and I am so indebted to the author of our study, the Reverend Susan Robb, for this illustration. In December of 1965, anybody here remember it? In December of 1965, a Charlie Brown Christmas based on the comic strip Peanuts by Charles M. Schultz made its broadcast debut. In this now classic Christmas special, which has aired every year since that initial showing, Charlie Brown finds himself depressed, even amidst all the Christmas cheer. His friend and amateur psychiatrist Lucy suggests that he direct the neighborhood Christmas play to lift his spirits. However, all of Charlie Brown's efforts to create what he aspires to present as the perfect play are mocked by his friends who regularly call him a blockhead. Well, the low point for Charlie Brown comes when in the eyes of the other kids, he even botches the simple task of choosing a Christmas tree as the centerpiece for the Christmas play. When he and his good friend Linus visit a tree lot, Charlie Brown passes right on by all of the rows of tall, thick, well-flocked trees, beautiful trees. And instead, he selects a small, sad-looking sapling with just a few spindly branches. When he, pre when he presents the tree to the play participants, predictably, they laugh at him, and they walk away. Rejected and downcast, Charlie Brown says to Linus, Well, I guess you were right, Linus. I shouldn't picked up this little tree. I guess I really don't even know what Christmas is all about. And then Charlie Brown shouts out in frustration, Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? And then stepping into the spotlight, Linus recites today's reading from Luke's Gospel. In that region, there were shepherds abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. The passage Linus reads ends with news from the angels that God is well pleased with human beings and expresses God's desire for peace on earth and goodwill among all people. And when Linus finishes reciting Luke's words, he walks out of the spotlight and says to his friend, that's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. Well, Linus may declare to everyone what Christmas is all about, but Charlie Brown then proceeds to show them. He carries the scrawny, unloved little tree to his backyard, passing right by Snoopy's dazzling, decorated doghouse. He looks up at the star in the sky that's twinkling, and he hears in his mind the words of the angels again. Then he places one ornament on one of the tree's scrawny branches, his friends follow, and they surround the tree, the little tree, lovingly adding decorations of their own. And when they finish, they move away from the sapling they had previously ridiculed and had written off. And it had become transformed into something radiant and beautiful. All it took was a little love, a little care, a little attention, and it really was the perfect tree for the play after all. A friend of Susan Robb's calls this the parable of the scrawny tree. Charlie Brown saw something in that little tree, something that no one else in his school could see. Its innate potential to shine. It's innate worth. 
If only it received a little love, a little care, and a little attention. Just as Charlie Brown rescued the scrawny tree from being dismissed or from being mocked or from being written off, Jesus said that he came as an expression of God's love to rescue the world, not to condemn it. God saw in us what Charlie Brown saw in that tree. We are not something to be shunned or condemned as hopeless or as someone just to be written off. But each one of us is a unique creation, a lovely creation, someone of worth created by God. Just as that little tree glowed brightly when surrounded by caring hands and love and attention, Jesus brings good news to the lowly, to the hurting, to the marginalized, to those the rest of the world would forget, to the shepherds of the world. He brings to them the good news that they are beloved, And they are precious to God, which enables them to shine, to be radiant. That's what the news that came to those shepherds that first Christmas night. That's the message they received. That's the love that was their Christmas gift. But such a love needs a response, doesn't it? This is the part of the story we so often gloss over. We tend, when we read this story every year, to focus on the way that God comes to those whom society would deem the least worthy. But when have we ever stopped to really deep dive into the response of the shepherds? They have been terrified in the field. Suddenly, they're surrounded by a multitude of angels, and and yet despite their fears, what do they do? They decide to go at once to Bethlehem. I love the wording from the King James Version, for it has it best. Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. The more modern versions, for the most part, I think, fail miserably to capture the mood of this dramatic scene. Let's go to Bethlehem, says one, and see this what thing that has happened. Let's just go. Good grief. You'd think they were, propo- they were proposing a midnight stroll or a walk at the beach. No. There's an urgency here a swift decisiveness. It's almost a matter of life and death about this immediate decision to go and seek out the newborn king. Why would you wait? Later this week, and certainly on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, there will be those annoying people who will maul over every Christmas package. They'll shake it. They'll weigh it. They'll consider the wording of the card, the color of the ribbon, the color of the wrapping paper. They'll even comment on the proper positioning of the scotch tape, which does nothing but drive everyone watching them towards the brink of screaming, well, will you open it already? I don't think I've ever been one to whom others have had to say that. I'm not long on patience, especially on Christmas Eve or Christmas morning. One of the big problems I suppose my mother always had with me was that she could seldom carefully fold the wrappings from my presents to be used for another year. My brother and I couldn't wait to tear into our presence on Christmas Day. 
And it seems to me that that's the way those shepherds acted that first Christmas. The way the Bible story has it, as soon as they got the good news, they said, let's go now to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass. Not, oh, well, by the way, the next time we're over near Bethlehem, we'll stop in and check on this. Let's go now. And that urgency, that joy, changed their lives. Shepherds then up and quick away, seek the babe at break of day. He is the hope of every nation. All in him shall find salvation. So to all the shepherds out there, to all the Charlie Browns out there, and to all those who need to hear it the most today, If you would receive the gift that God wants to give to you this Christmas, if today you would know a very special quality of joy, if today you would accept God's love for you and in you for others, if you would, then let us join hands with the shepherds of old, And let us go now to Bethlehem and see what has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. For our next hymn, we are going to sing hymn number 50 in the hymnal. We've never sung this one before, but fear not. <laughs> it, I really, really wanted to do this because I think you'll agree with me. It fits our theme and our text this morning. So the choir will sing it through once for us, both verses, to, just to show us how it should be done. <laughs> and then after they've sung it, we will stand and we will sing the two verses together. Choir, show us how it should be done.
affirm our faith using the words of the Advent affirmation found in your bulletin. We are an Advent people, a people of hope. For us, Advent is a time of waiting, and so we wait. We wait for the coming of the one who is the fulfillment of God's promise, the fulfillment of hope, the declaration that we have been redeemed. Even so, we are not a naive people. We know that the world in which we live will continue to be filled with pain and sorrow. We know that hatred and violence will continue to exist. We know that death and separation will continue to be a part of our lives. But because we are an Advent people, we know that none of these things will win in the end. The Holy One is coming to make holy once again all that was, is, and ever will be. And in our waiting and our hoping, we work and worship, pray and play, in all things hoping that peace, love, and joy will reign in our lives and in our world now and forever. Let us pray. O oh Lord, you who delight to announce the birth of Jesus, not to professional heralds of the empire, capable of successfully spreading the news to the largest number of people, persons of influence, women and men of sophistication who would know how to get things done. But rather, you come to a paltry number of shepherds, basically nobodies in the world, rude, rough, and easily forgettable, to whom a needlessly excessive host of angels sing an exquisite anthem and who spread the news throughout the all-too-little town of Bethlehem, stirring the hearts of a few souls, astonishing a handful of night owls, then returning to their day jobs near dawn, back to the grind of their small, unsophisticated lives. May we, like you, delight to give extravagantly of ourselves and of our goods to the least and to the lost, lost to their own selves, lost on the way to who knows what anymore, but certainly never lost to you. May we give even to those who may not fully appreciate what we have given, but who nonetheless deserve the best and the finest, so that we might acquire a heart of generosity that knows no bounds, a heart that gives without expectation of return, that offers the entire pantry of our lives in joy because we know to whom we belong, to a gracious God in heaven who owns the cattle on a thousand hills and who gives us the spirit without measure, a God with a heart of generosity that knows no bounds and that gives without expectation of return. On this fourth Sunday of Advent, we join our voices and our hearts and our prayers with countless millions of others, O oh God, as we prepare to once again go in heart and in mind to Bethlehem. As we return to precious traditions, beautiful music, 
reunion with families, celebrations with dear friends, our hearts brim full with gratitude. And we thank you, dear God, for all of it. Grant to each one of us the opportunity to slow down and to enjoy the precious gift of life itself. Thank you, dear God, for the reminder we need this year that your love still comes to us in surprising and unexpected ways, even in unlikely places. And thank you, God, for reminding us that love, your love, is the ultimate reality. That the, that the last word on today is not hatred, not violence, not war, but love. A love that was shown in the birth of a child so long ago. In that birth, in an out-of-the-way village, in a remote corner of a vast empire, O oh God, you spoke a word of peace and hope for the whole human family. And we come to you today concerned for our world, for our communities, for our cities that continue to be plagued by violence and war. We cling, O oh God, at Christmas to the angel's promise of peace on earth and goodwill to all. And so we pray for peace. We pray for goodwill. We pray for all of our leaders. We pray for the men and women of our armed forces. We would even pray for ourselves that we, that you might use each one of us in whatever way we can to bring about that peace and that goodwill among all. We pray, dear God, for those whose needs are so urgent this morning whose names we mention to you in the silence of our hearts. And we pray for ourselves. In these final days of preparation, come to each of us with your perfect love which casts out all fear. Prepare our hearts to welcome him anew. Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who taught his disciples and who bids us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
behold, I bring you tidings of great joy. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. When are we going to go to Bethlehem? Now. When? Now. Come on, shepherds, time to shake off your drowsy sleep. Leave your silly sheep. Rise up and follow. Follow all the way to Bethlehem so that we might see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. Come on, shepherds. Let's go back into this good day in peace. We can be of good courage. Hold on to all those things which are good. Return no one, no one, not even a shepherd, evil for evil. Together, let us support the weak, help the suffering, honor and serve everyone that we meet, even as God, through the birth of God's Son, has honored, served, and loved us. Come on, shepherds. Let us go now, even unto Bethlehem. And as we go, may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and with all those whom you love, and with all those whom only God loves. Amen.